Um, and I guess the, the segue now into our original topic we're going to talk about is uh, a book about sort of neoliberalism and the kind of this neoliberal end of history by Mark Fisher called Capitalist Realism. And I think the thought, like, he the, he describes, Amber, I think you should talk, you should sort of introduce it, but like, I'll say, like, he introduces the concept of capitalist realism as this kind of end of history sensibility in which it is considered unrealistic to even imagine an alternative to uh, the economic order and society in, in which we live. And I think the segue is, are we beginning to see people imagining that different world? <clears throat> well, Fisher was an incredibly prescient writer, first of all. The first time I had ever read anything by him, even though I knew he had a blog called K-Punk that was very popular with a certain um, kind of pop left intellectual things, but I had never read it. But he had this essay called uh, Exiting the Vampire's Castle. You can Google it, by the way. It's on uh, the North Star, I think. It's short. And it came out, let's see here, 2013, in November of 2013. And he was one of the first people to say, hey, I think maybe some of these identity politics are um, actually being used to, uh, how shall we say it, uh, dishonest ends. <laughs> <laughs> um, this might yeah, be a little cynical. He wrote that in, in 2013, and he wrote it in response to... Uh, I don't know if you guys remember this, uh, but this was when Russell Brand was interviewed by Jeremy Paxman on yeah. British television. And like Jeremy Paxman is, I guess, they're sort of Tim Russert. I, I guess like he, he's the guy who interviews politicians and celebrities and, and like his shtick is making them look foolish or, you know, pointing out some hypocrisy in past quotes yeah. or whatever. He's this sort of like this very uh, – Being- Serious Clever. sort of yeah. yeah, like you know, uh he is the uh the discourse, as it were. Right. And he tried to pull it on Russell Brand to be like, Well, who are you a celebrity to tell people about yeah. socialism or whatever? And Brand absolutely got the better of him in that interview. Yeah. If anyone wants to, you can look it up, I'm sure it's on YouTube. But it's super fun it and also really funny fun because funny. I think he expected Russell Brand to be very stupid. Yeah. Which is always funny when someone expects someone to be stupid and they're very quick and witty. So yeah. it's fun to watch. It is. I, I loved watching it, and Brand absolutely got the better of him, and he had no idea what to make make of it. Right. And what and the thing he had no idea what to make of is how sincere Brand got by the end of it. Yeah. Because he's used to talking to people like you know British politicians or whatever who are just have talking cynical and, monsters yeah. and don't really believe in anything. All pedophiles. Yeah. <laughs> all pedophiles. <laughs> um, so I saw that, and uh, this is God. This is before I even knew you, Amber. And I yeah, remember yeah. reading this this article, and I'm glad we we came back to it. But the article is written in response to the response to Brand. Yeah, when people ostensibly on the left begin <laughs> critiquing him for what being sexist or something. Yeah, because he would like call women birds or yeah. lorries or whatever. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> uh, and uh, he actually wrote a really good response to it too. That was like, I don't think I'm sexist. I mean, maybe I am, but I think I'm just sort of using you know working class vernacular. Um, and you know. Could have been a very interesting conversation about how, you know, gender is in many ways more emphasized for working class people or in in some ways less emphasized, depending on your sort of professional strata. But it didn't turn into that. It turned into like Russell Brand is like a piece of shit sexist and nothing he says will ever be useful. Um, So Fisher wrote uh, a what I I think a a very good response to it and a very good response to the kind of emerging libidinal discourse, I believe is what he called it at the time, which is basically like Twitter freakouts and like struggle sessions and these uh, ridiculous pylons, which still concern me today, even though they're out of Vogue, Mm -hmm. but I I think they still happen. Here, let me just quote from this piece. He says, uh, I've noticed a fascinating magical inversion projection disavowal mechanism whereby the sheer mention of class is now automatically treated as if that means one is trying to downgrade the importance of race and gender. In fact, the exact opposite is the case, as the vampire's castle uses an ultimately liberal understanding of race and gender to obfuscate class. And, And he wrote this in 2013, which seems like ancient fucking history now which is yeah. terrifying as well and it was insane how furious people got with him because 
specifically because like one, like reading this, I, I remember being very skeptical of this essay at the time, like, oh, it's not that bad. But I agreed with some of it. Um, but reading it now, it's like, oh, shit, he was absolutely 100% right about everything. <laughs> that the reaction to him was so visceral because I think he exposed a lot of these people for being whatever liberal Trojan horses or just plain narcissists or unhinged. I mean, there are quite a few kind of there's a there's a lovely kind of quilt of of uh, motivations behind uh, mm-hmm. you know this kind of liberal red baiting. But Amber, could you could you talk a bit about how his critique of uh, moralism? As, as as a means for discussing these things and, and how it sort of damages solidarity. Uh, right. <laughs> Could I? Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, he, I hate to just like read these excerpts or whatever, but, you know, he uses this metaphor of this gothic metaphor of the vampire's castle or whatever. It's frankly a very weird metaphor, but once you read it, it makes more sense. Um, but the problem with the vampire's castle was set up to solve this. How do you hold immense wealth and power while also appearing as a victim, marginal and oppositional? The solution was already there in the Christian church. So the vampire castle has recourse to all the infernal strategies and dark pathologies and psychological torture instruments at which were described by Nietzsche in the genealogy of morals. Um, the priesthood of bad conscience, this nest of pious guilt mongers, is exactly what Nietzsche predicted when he said that something worse than Christianity was already on the way. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's uh, on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, it's twi- Twitter is the answer to that. But like he, at the end of the piece, he lays out these sort of laws of the vampire castle, and I think we should go through them because I think they're uh, an interesting way to view uh, a lot of the annoying shit that we've talked about in the past of these kind of false critiques of the left or whatever from, you know, liberal. Disingenuous Yeah, these sort of disingenuous critiques. He says, the first law of the vampire's castle is individualize and privatize everything. And he says, while in theory it claims to be a favor in favor of structural critique, in practice it never focuses on anything except individual behavior. Which is so obvious now. Yeah. It's It's like, you know, tweet searching something or, you know, it's absurd. Like you see it all the time. You know, the foundation of someone's politics and you see someone look up an offhand comment or a weird joke or whatever. And it's like, well, how can we stand in solidarity with this person? It's like, because you know who they are and what they believe. You don't have to personally like them. That's mm-hmm. the great thing about socialism. That's why it has more uh, political coherence than, say, anarchism, because it doesn't rely on relationships. Yeah, but uh, again, it, I, I, I can't emphasize enough, like, the tone of the essay being... Like, he was not anyone in this room. He was not, like, a Chapo-style guy. He was giving, like, this very, like, gentle, sweet critique... <laughs> That, like, revolted people and terrified them, I think, because he exposed, a, a, like, this very nasty kind of disingenuous critique. Mm-hmm. I don't want to spend too much time on this. I mean, like, the it's we'll link to the piece, but, like, the other laws are just basically about, uh, you know, the this sort of – it's all about this tone of scolding, being Propagating against guilt. humor. Uh, a, you know, make a guilt as like a means for like the you know discussing other people's motivations and privilege and mm-hmm. things like that, and sort of essentializing identity over everything, which makes basically doing or talking about anything impossible. Yeah, and it culminates in like the final law: think like a liberal because you are one. Yeah. Moving on from there to to his book, which is like a, a bigger thesis statement mm-hmm. about. It is, however, only like eighty pages. Well, that's what I was going to say. For fans <laughs> of the show, if you're like me, you will enjoy this book because. Because A, it's 80 pages long, and B, mostly blissfully free of the kind of academic and Marxist jargon that I find to be, uh, turns my brain into soup, basically. Yeah, there's a touch. I mean, like, I ain't read no Deleuze, but uh, it's nothing that I had to do any extensive research oh, on yeah, or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Also, he uses pop culture, yes. but he uses the pop culture of adult humans. Mm-hmm. Which is great. He talks about James Elroy in the second chapter. <laughs> so this is like, okay, this is extremely my, my type of shit. But I think that the first example that he uses to talk about this kind of end of history, no future, kind of like dead end mindset is the phenomenon of remakes and like movies and things like that. That we're, and 
absolutely seeing being accelerated right now, this idea that we as a culture are just like not even creating anything new anymore. We're just re-digesting things that we've already things that have already happened and things that we've already done. Which when it happens on this kind of mass scale now and becomes a mode of Hollywood industrial production, I think it does become kind of terrifying in a way. There, yeah. It does take on a kind of apocalyptic cant. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like artistic cynicism. Um, it's like, well, what could we don't? It's just this uh, torpor and entertainment, which is what it is. Not art has become so mechanized. Um, and I don't know. There's probably an app that writes all these movies anyway, or rewrites all of these remakes anyway. Um, it, that it, it's not even like there's anything particularly inspiring. Uh, to look at on the horizon, uh, which is strange because generally in times of, of um, you know, extreme, uh, like, historical inequality, um, we tend to think of them as times of, of, uh, of sort of renaissance, you know? Yeah. But that's, I, I think, at least seemingly <laughs> uniquely, not the case at all right now. Well, that's why what was struck me reading it is his very first example, the first thing he talks about, is the movie Children of Men and how yeah. its evocation of sterility as the overriding uh, sort of cultural reality, like the metaphor. And I find that like very recognizably true. Uh, he talks about it being unique from other post-apocalyptic movies. Uh, like in that way and it's like no there are still like coffee shops things are still running fine nothing has come to an end like society is still functioning oh, yeah. it's just terrible it, yes yeah, we don't have a, we don't necessarily have a dictatorship you know it could it could very well be a, a, a superficially democratic government running things and and if you think about that movie and one of the things uh, Quran does so amazingly is the fact that like the whole movie is like several very very long shots i think there's only about 70 or so edits in mm -hmm. the movie so you're sort of following Clive Owen through this near future and in these long shots you're just sort of seeing his perspective but all of the real horror is just sort of at the periphery of your perception like as the viewer by a Clive Owen, you just get out of a train station, you walk through it, and there are just cages of refugees that you only see for like a couple seconds. Yeah, but they're there, and it's just sort of in the periphery. It's just sort of just just on the edge of your perception that you kind of edit out walking down the street of an urban environment. Yeah, which we do that every movie, day here in New York. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I honestly, when I I saw it in the theater, and it's the still to this day the only movie where like I had. I honestly had like a mini nervous breakdown after I saw it. Mm -hmm. I saw it with some friends and I was like, I was just struck dumb for like a half an hour because it just felt like such a condensation of every just hopeless horror that yeah. the current moment had. And this was during the Bush administration for Christ's sake, which of course now everybody's looking back on fondly. Uh, and <laughs> certainly no so listener like I, of uh, the, our podcast. No, I would oh, hope yeah. not. I would hope not. But but I, I do feel like that movie more than any other of the 21st century encapsulates the specific hopelessness and and just low level dread uh, that comes with living in a world where there really is no future and even. Even the suggestion that there could be one is met with just derision. Yeah, and that's the whole sort of concept of of capitalist realism. It's and he he, he makes a, a distinction where he's talking about student movements. Um, I think in like chapter four, and he says, by contrast with their forebears in the nineteen sixties and seventies, British students today appear to be politically disengaged. While French students who can still be found in the streets protesting against neoliberalism, British students whose situation is incomparably worse seem resigned to their fate. But this, I want to argue, is a matter not of apathy nor of cynicism, but of reflexive impotence. They know things are bad, but more than that, they know they can't do anything about it. But that knowledge, that reflexivity, is not a passive observation of, of an already existing state of affairs. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And and the other thing that he the other, other really important point that he makes on early in the more in the, in this book talking about like what is neoliberalism and and sort of how does it work in our 
individual and sort of cultural consciousness is that it doesn't really require uh, propaganda in the way that like old forms of control and government do. Like that even the, you know, uh, reactions to it or against it are part of it in itself. Like it's it's sort of the it totally self-sustaining. very yeah. quickly. Um, you know, if you look at advertising as a good example, and he does a good job talking about advertising without sounding all ad busters and anti-consumerists. <laughs> but he's like, you know, they've uh, um, immediately assumed like, you know, green capitalism. Like that popped out so quickly. And now it's like this tight machine, you know, uh, which is ridiculous because it's a it's a counterintuitive con- concept. That like it, 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 one of the reasons it's so successful and has permeated so much of our lives is how effective it is at sort of absorbing everything. It's almost like like a blob concept. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is, again, why it's super strange now to see people suddenly snapped into action. Um, but he does sort of warn against when he's talking about the students. And I think he says this not, you know, not in dismissively, but he says, so you have French students now, and they're protesting against neoliberal cuts, and they're using, like, you know, 68 slogans. You mm-hmm. know, they're using, like, radical slogans. He's like, but the only thing they're doing is protesting against cuts. Like, he's like, there's no grand project on the horizon for them. All that they can think of to fight for is keeping things the way they are. And the same went for the trade unions. And so it's, you know, you have... French students that that were in a state of, uh, or or less of a state of, I guess, um, uh, reflexive impotence than, say, English students on the whole. But still, there was no great ambition. They're not 68. They're not, like, you know, trying to overthrow the government and, and replace it with something better. The most they can manage to envision is just, please don't cut our shit. <laughs> I was hoping, um, can we talk a little bit about, like, his... The critique that uh, he advances in this book, particularly about <clears throat> how we can think about um, the, the social roots of mental health phenomenon. And like th- this goes yeah. back to th- this idea of learned impotence, which is a kind of depression. But uh, there's also you know addiction, attention deficit disorder, these very common um, – you know, anxiety disorders, things like that, like increasingly, incre- common. increasingly common and medicated uh, phenomenon. That the, the sort of demand that we have to think about these things in a kind of capitalist context, or that they are the byproducts of capitalism, basically. Yeah, I, I, Fisher uh, struggled with mental health uh, his whole life, and uh, tragically, uh, he died very recently after taking his life. Um, but he wrote incredibly well about it. Um, and there's actually, there's one, it, my favorite essay of his is actually called Good for Nothing. And I, it's kind of like a, like a fail son ethos. <laughs> it has sort of like his, his analysis of his depression, uh, written up within like a, you know, an analysis of, of capitalism. But there's this one line where he said, um, uh, my depression was always tied up with the conviction that I was literally good for nothing. I spent most of my life up until the age of 30 believing that I would never work. In my 20s, I drifted between postgraduate study, periods of unemployment, and temporary jobs. In each of these roles, I felt that I didn't really belong. In postgraduate study, because I was a dilettante who had somehow faked his way through, not a proper scholar. In unemployment, because I wasn't really unemployed like those who were honestly seeking work, but a shirker. And in temporary jobs, because I felt I was performing incompetently, and in any case, I didn't really belong in these office or factory jobs, not because I was too good for them, but but very much to the contrary, because I was overeducated and useless. Even when I was on a psychiatric ward, I felt I was not really depressed. I was only simulating the condition in order to avoid work, or the infernally, or in the infernally paradoxical logic of depression, I was simulating it in order to conceal the fact that I was not capable of working, and that there was no place at all for me in society." I think that describes the way a lot of people feel. It's certainly, I mean, like, I, yeah. I, I would never I was as depressed as he was, but that definitely describes my 20s in a lot of ways. Yeah, oh, I yeah, ended up... it's very familiar. I ended up quoting him because someone, like, wrote me it, for your sorry ass, my advice column. They're like, I have realized that I, I can't... 
I can't work in an office. Like I, like they're like, I literally can't do it. It's like, you know, grinding, um, you know, work that I'm doing poorly at. And, uh, you know, all wage labor is alienated labor, but like some of it's a lot more alienating than others. Oh, for sure. Um, and this idea of this imposter syndrome where you just feel incompetent and ineffectual and like you can never keep up is again, built into this kind of, uh, you know, neoliberal vision of people as like nomads as like constantly, uh, justifying their own job. Everybody is an independent contractor yeah, with the yeah. rest of the world. You yeah, know? you're constantly, yeah. And like, you know, that's hence the acceleration of all these temporary jobs. I mean, he talks about like, you know, precariat is like, like, I agree, a stupid word, especially since it just describes most people. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, he talks about like uh, people being jostled around from job to job and how it really wears on you and you literally start to think that maybe you're just not meant for work. And we kind of aren't in the way that work exists now. Like, it's not good for people. No. Everyone's sick and miserable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that's what, yeah, we know. We need, we need less of it. I've, I've said that many times before on this show. We need, less work, we need, man. Uh, less work for more <laughs> money is, uh, that's, that's, that's my credo. Yeah. I think that's, that's what we all need. But, um, okay, let me, let me just read this quote here. He says, The rejection of identitarianism can only be achieved by the reassertion of class. A left that does not have class as its core can only be a liberal pressure group. Class consciousness is always double. It involves a simultaneous knowledge of the way in which class frames and shapes all experience and a knowledge of the particular position that we occupy in the class structure. Right. But also, I mean, there's arguments whether or not class constitutes an identity or something. But like, if you're talking about consciousness being an aspect of it, I think there is an argument that you do, it does need to be some kind of identity, like in the sense, I'm a worker, but it's a material identity. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's not necessarily political or, you know, whatever, aesthetic, or whatever, it has to do with your relationship to power. Um, which is defined by capital, <laughs> right? Going back to to, to 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 JFK and 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 our current moment that we're living in that 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 seems, uh, you know, dire in a way that you know, uh, I haven't I haven't felt before. Even though things were fucked up before, and like you always fall into the trap of being like. Someone can always just say, "Oh, like, well, didn't you notice this before?" Like, and granted, yeah, those like, people are shitheads, by yeah, the way. Yeah, like I. I you should definitely be saying to liberals who are just now figuring out how bad things are, it's like, well, you know, some of this stuff actually came through with Obama, but, like, the whole, where were you? Like, shut the fuck up. No one needs that shit. You're not organizing anyone. You're just alienating people. Your job is to be radicalizing liberals, not making them feel like shit. Yeah, not being a, not being a scold and a tattle. Yeah, and also, you know? no one likes a fucking tattle. The answer of where were you is the same for both the person being asked and the person asking, which is posting. <laughs> <laughs> we were online, never logging off. You were all yes. online. Nobody was doing anything. Everyone was posting. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> but I mean, like, you know, he, he was talking about the students, and it's interesting because we've moved from being like, you know, the English students who have neither an offense nor a defense because they've internalized just the pure inevitability of capitalism. Um, uh, the the that Francis Fukuyama end of mm-hmm. history thing where it's like nope this is our final form you know which there is, re- is no alternative <laughs> <laughs> which makes no sense at all because like what what would you like industrial capitalism was around since like the 18th century like it's like a blip it's it's a blip in history we had so many more political systems before that that went on much longer it's absurd to think of capitalism as an inevitability but it's especially neoliberal capitalism is it's it's so good at convincing us without even any active propaganda like you said before that like well this is it this is our final form right because and this is a thing that he talks about so well in the book it's so diffused there are like centers of control emanating downward yeah. throughout society and that's that that structure creates oppositional frameworks in the mind. Like yeah. if there's well, a the refugees, a fucking, if there's a guy in a castle, you can go in the castle and drag him out realistically. 
And so just that very, the geography of it makes makes rebellion and change and something else viable to imagine. If it's all invisible, if it's all basically, like as he says in the book, like a parasite in our minds, and it's not located in a physical space, separate from us, then it becomes very difficult to conceive of any alternative. Yeah, because who are you going to attack? You can't, you can't find, yeah, you can't find the king. We have no kings. God, it was great when we had kings. You could just kill the king. <laughs> well, and, and this goes back to what I said uh, on the pre-taped Colin show, is that like the word, uh, you know, neoliberalism is being used more and more, and it is very hard to define it. Like, it is this very vaporous term that can... Mm come to mean something similar to things I don't like yeah, in yeah. the current political system, which is useful in a way, but like, what is a, what is a more rigorous way of, of thinking about it? Do you have an idea or is there, is it, does Fisher, like, what, is there something he can offer? I mean, Fisher uses uh, David Harvey's um, definition of neoliberalism, uh, I believe, which I like a lot and some people have sort of objections to, but uh, so, yeah, uh, Fisher uses Harvey's definition where uh, we said the persistent association of neoliberalism with the term restoration favored by both Badiou and David Harvey is an important corrective to the association of capital with novelty. For Harvey and Badiou, neoliberal politics are not the new, but a return of class power and privilege. In France, Badiou has said, Restoration refers to the period of the return of the king in 1815 after the revolution of Napoleon. We are in such a period. Today we see liberal capitalism and its political system, parliamentarianism, as the only natural and acceptable solutions. Harvey argues that neoliberalization is best conceived of as a political project to reestablish the conditions of capital accumulation to restore the power of economic elites. So basically we've acknowledged that Class war, and Harvey's big line with this is that neoliberalism is the period like uh, where class war is only being waged by uh, by the capitalists. Mm-hmm. Uh, labor is Come, sputtering way, on like, the map. Coming out of a reaction to like the middle 20th century, yeah. uh, you know. Uh, when there were these projects that this, were fighting yeah. against capital and everything, and there were these major movements, and now just sputtering on the mat. Now we're all like, you know, at best, these French students just fighting to hold on to, you know, what little gains we have and losing, of course, um, because we don't have an alternative... A project that we're pushing through. We have no, we have no offense. We have only defense. The defense is pathetic and losing. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think, I think neoliberalism, it turns historically, uh, is post us losing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, organized labor. I mean, there are projects like you know, the nurses have always been pushing for socialized healthcare and everything. But like, it's not a formidable offense that working people have. And they used to have this growing project that was very promising, and it just we lost, which happens a lot. I'm not going to be like, oh, there was some horrible um, – it's just like, no, the capitalists were bigger and stronger, and they were faster, and they outsmarted us. And, and now we need to – and now they've – you know, it, there's retrenchment, and, and they, they won, and we're not doing anything except trying to get air, and we have to have a new project because it's just – it's not going to work being at the airport every single fucking day fighting these because it's just going to be another executive order and another and another. Do you think that the, this neoliberal – I mean like there's sort of – there's a right and a left wing to neoliberalism. Again, this is why yeah. it's sort of, sort of so successful is because it can, it can fit into any shape. Like a know? sponge. Yeah, exactly. Whether it's a right wing or technically – uh, like or labor government, for instance. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's definitely. I, it's much more obvious in in the UK, um, and following their politics is extremely upsetting <laughs> because you know they have a quote unquote labor party, but they're trash. They're total trash. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of like you know, f- uh, fighting against this or or thinking about like how you as personally like fit into this, like. Like, how do you know that, like, you're, that you're living embedded in this, or that you're being? I, I always just think of like, how do we the, put on the, the they or, live? Or just like, the, yeah, the they live. But I always just think of like all of the the subtle and not so subtle ways in which we're sort of encouraged to think about ourselves as these sort of 
individualized atomized nodes in this yeah. big grand system where like everybody's totally free yeah. to just to just you know live up to their creative potential and do whatever they want but just completely alone yeah we're all and, just nomads <laughs> yeah. and like you know living in tent cities it's great it's it's freeing <laughs> <laughs> and that may be a way do you think that you're doing something different than that is doing something in a in solidarity in a, in, in a group right Right. Well, I mean, I think people do want to imagine something themselves to be working toward like a larger noble project. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and there are quite a few sort of options for that. Um, But I mean, solidarity is 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 a pretty powerful thing. And the idea that, again, like I don't want to reduce class to identity. Um, because it is a ma- material relationship to power. Um, but class consciousness, it can keep you going, and it can be helpful because we're all sick and 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 bored and miserable and terrified all the time. <laughs> um, it can be helpful to keep in mind that, like, this is because, you know, we're being ground into dust by, by our precarity and by the horrible things that we're not able to fight against because we don't have political institutions. And most importantly, it's not your fault if you feel like it's not some yeah. d- it's not some dysfunction in you personally. Like yeah. they, they, like all of these things are could be are, are rational responses to the the, the conditions. Yeah, that, it would that be insane in. if you were extremely mentally healthy. If you were like you know trying to get by on thirty hours a week, and then also you know search for another job that would give you full time so that you could get health insurance and, you know, worried about your Obamacare fucking premiums. And like, wait, that's, that's crushing your very human brain. That's a horrible amount of stress. There's nothing stable about it. And it's difficult to think of anything else, honestly. Um, But I don't know. I mean, I, I think if we ride this kind of surge of action forward and, present new ideas and new demands and, you know, start to the very hard, boring work of building new institutions, I think we could get up off the mat. I think that uh, we could we could exceed just having a good uh, defense. Because at this point, too, I think we've realized, like, a, a defense just doesn't work either. Like, we've, we're losing ground. We can't – nothing is safe. All even you know like with the the bastions of a uh, of uh, social welfare states you know Scandinavia they're they're experiencing neoliberalism too mm-hmm. like they're having cuts like nothing is safe we need something bigger.